Mustang is a special podcast production of Boise State Public Radio and the Mountain West News Bureau. Support for this series comes from Barbarian Brewing, who believes all it takes is a few untamed minds, a little elbow grease, and a few pints of beer to make true innovation happen. That is the sound of a skinny wild horse pawing at the snow and eating hay in my pasture. And I'm just sitting here looking at him and wondering what I've done. (laughs) But I'm so damn excited. His name is Bua'a, which means friend in Paiute, Burns Paiute, which is his country, kind of where he comes from. And the folks who lived there for millennia, the chairwoman of the tribe, Diane Tiemann, told me the word for friend, Bua'a. So this is Boo. And he's home. And he's skinny. And I plan on, for the time being, just feeding him a lot and sitting with him and telling him stories of our adventures that we're going to have. I would go and sit with Boo every day, all winter and into the spring, just hoping he'd start to trust me and want to be around me. It had to be his choice to come to me, to choose me. I was determined that I wasn't going to rope him or force him the way a lot of cowboys might. It's springtime and, uh, There's still a lot of snow on the ground, but it's warm and sunny. And I'm standing next to Boo in his uh, round pen. And he's just munching quietly with me. And I guess I just wanted to document the baby photos. This is like an audio baby photo. Boo is, you know, he's little. He's, He's only... We, we think less than 14, maybe 14 hands right now. And he doesn't let me brush his tail yet. And he, um, but he does follow me around like a puppy dog and seems to want to be with me. Even if I'm kind of ignoring him, which I do a lot because I don't want to come on too strong. He doesn't like it when I come on too strong. He likes it when I sing to him. So... Sometimes I come in his pen and um, Amazing Grace seems to be the go-to because it's kind of calm and not too high energy. And I love him. I just love him so much. He is just giving his trust to me in tiny little bits, one piece at a time, you know. He lets me touch his white spot on his face. He lets me rub his chin or his chest. He's starting to let me pick up his hoofs, just the front ones, and brush his body, but not too much on his butt. He doesn't like too much back there. And we've been walking on the lead around the pen and taking him in and out for just little little jaunts, not far, because he gets nervous. Just coming out and making it a positive experience and making everything a positive experience. And what I've noticed so clearly with this horse is when I walk in with any kind of anger or stress or trouble that I'm carrying from whatever else is going on outside of this round pen, it'll ruin a training session. It it ruins it. He, He picks up on it. I don't breathe the same way. I don't know what the little tiny signals are, but he is so attuned and it translates into how he presents himself to me. And I'm sure in how I present myself to him. And it's just a really good reminder to be be fully present, to be, you know, to check everything else at the gate when I go in. And sometimes a whole session is just standing there singing to him. And then I leave him alone. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like
like me. Hey folks, if you're enjoying Boo's story and there's a little person in your life who you think might enjoy it too, I wanted to let you know that I wrote a kid's book to accompany this podcast. It's beautifully illustrated by Katie Michael. She's the gal who did the art for this series. You can get your very own copy at thelittleblackmustang.com. That's thelittleblackmustang.com. Okay, now we're heading to Nevada, because if you want to see wild horses, this is the place. Of the 80,000 or so wild horses total in the U.S., 54,000 of them are in Nevada. There are more horses here than in any other state. And I'd heard that when there are too many wild horses in a given area, the ecosystem suffers. Just like when you see too many domestic horses grazing in one pasture. The grass gets eaten down to nubs, and not much else tends to survive but I needed to see it for myself in the wild. So I reached out to two biologists on opposite sides of Nevada who agreed to show me what things look like on the ground. I started in the northwestern part of the state, between Reno and Winnemucca, with Mike Cox. Mike's worked for the Nevada Department of Wildlife for 30 years. And in that time, he's watched wild horse herds take over the rangelands he studies. Yeah, those are horses. Um... Hang on a second. You getting a count? Yeah. We're parked on the side of a dirt road about 10 miles south of the I-80 freeway in the Stillwater mountain range. All righty. I'm going to go from left to right. Certainly a lot of singles out there, but there's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 couple cows out there. Yeah, so a little group of about 50 horses and and maybe 10 cows that are nearby. The horses are about two miles away, grazing peacefully, spread out across the foothills of the mountains. I can see the varied colors of their coats, reds, browns, whites, like little splashes against the faded sagebrush. Mike knows there are more horses around. The Bureau of Land Management estimates there are about 1,700 of them in this area, way outnumbering the number of cows that are permitted to graze here. Since the Wild Horse and Burrow Act was passed in 1971, the population of horses has increased steadily. And Mike says the land is maxed out. Too many horses. The land can only support about 8,000. When you say the land, you're talking about the state of Nevada or this range in particular, this HMA? The whole state. 8,000 horses in the state of Nevada. And you have how many? Man, there's about 54,000. So this state's got it worst of all the states that have wild horses. Yeah, we're a bastard child. No one one cares about us. (laughs) They have no idea that we're the driest state in the union. That's the key here. Water. There is not much of it in this part of the world, maybe three to seven inches per year, depending on the drought cycle. That means there's not much lush green grass or other plants that deer, bighorn sheep, cows, and horses need to survive. And that drought cycle he mentioned, it's gotten worse. Mike said there used to be one drought year out of every eight, but now one out of every three years is declared a drought. So when you drive through the state of Nevada, it may look like this massive expanse of open range, right? Like how could there be too many horses out there? Or too many anything for that matter? There's so much room to roam and feed. But these are not lush, productive prairie grasslands. They're fragile, arid, sagebrush deserts. They're not strong enough to be aggressively grazed by thousands of animals. We've only gone maybe a mile or so down the dirt road before I spot some more grazers. I can't tell, but that looks like a lot of animals over there. Yeah, let's take a look. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, oh boy. (laughs) Yeah, 
horses we got 10 20 30 40 50 60 70 80 Oh yeah, they're way over there. On the left, they stretch all the way across. 90, 100, yeah, about a mile and a half stretch. There's some, a few scattered to the north. How do you feel when you're counting numbers like that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm numb to it. Uh, I've, my blood doesn't boil anymore. It, it is what it is. Um, but again, the land can't support because what what happens is they're not doing any more damage than it already has this this day, next week, next month. But then, when the temperatures ramp up to ninety to one hundred degrees, relative humidity will be below fifteen, and we haven't seen a drop of rain in two months. They have to be within a mile of water. That, that right there is the problem. Because then they pound those areas near the yeah. water that's, that's still available. Yeah, everything, it's a moonscape. We get back in the truck and head toward the freeway. And to be honest, I'm feeling kind of numb too. I have loved wild horses for a long time. The image of them. Racing across the sagebrush is so potent in my mind's eye, as it is for so many people. I picture Boo and his family in the Oregon high desert. They seem so natural out there, such an iconic part of the landscape. It's hard to think of them as an invasive threat to a fragile ecosystem. But that's how Mike sees them. After years of studying the intricate web of plants and animals across this state, a web that he says is starting to come apart. He peers out the window as he drives, clutching the wheel with both hands, shoulders hunched. I don't have answers for you today. You got a lot of anger, though. <laughs> I have a lot of frustration. Yeah. Bent up frustration. Yeah. And the ecosystem is going to collapse. I, I would give parts of Nevada a decade. That's all it's got left. With this number of horses on it? Yeah. And then there's not going to be anything for anyone, for any animal. After leaving Mike Cox, I drove to the opposite side of the state and parked my truck maybe 30 miles southeast of Elko to camp for the night. And I didn't get much sleep. Scott Roberts is here. He's 10 minutes early, which makes it 4.30 a.m. It's still dark, and I'm sitting on my tailgate about halfway through a cup of coffee. You're 10 minutes early. Yeah, I'm sorry. And you almost got the jump on me. I have to record you pulling up. <laughs> Scott's a biologist with the Nevada Department of Wildlife, like Mike. But he's at the beginning of his career. He's got a two-year-old and a three-year-old at home. So he says he's used to getting up at this ungodly hour. <laughs> I had dreams all night that I was late, you know. Of yeah. Like, you know, when you do stuff like this. Okay, so where are we, Scott? What are we doing? So we are making our way into Ruby Valley, mm-hmm. heading out to County Sage Grouse Lack. Okay, so you do this on the regular. The word lek means happy place in Swedish. It's the term for the sites where sage grouse gather to dance and mate. These birds are becoming more and more rare across the West. I'm here because I want to know if wild horses, whose populations are on the rise, are playing a role in the demise of the sage grouse. But as we drive toward the lek, Scott wants to talk about a whole lot more than sage grouse. He starts telling me about pronghorn and elk and bighorn sheep and mule deer all of whom live in this valley and the mountains that surround it, and are in direct competition with wild horses. And just like what Mike was saying, it's about water. In this valley, there are just a handful of natural springs, and some of them are really small, maybe flowing less than a gallon a minute into these potholes the size of dinner plates. That means everyone is competing to get a drink. Horses will actively guard that water until it fills you know, a small puddle up and they're able to drink. I mean, it's full on battle between different horse herds fighting for that water. And, you know, it's, 
winner takes all in there, you know, especially when you're talking about those isolated springs where there's not another available option for miles and miles and that, you know, they're it's desperate times. Scott knows this because he's seen it on the game cameras he monitors throughout the valley. Each camera will take more than 30,000 photos before the battery dies. Then Scott goes and collects the memory card and analyzes all the images to tally up how many pictures there are of horses and how many pictures there are of all the other creatures. And horses were making up 93 to almost 100% of the pictures. And there's nothing more disappointing than there's one set of pictures. There's a great big bull elk, big six point, prime of his life, big antlers, huge healthy body. And he looks up, has water dripping from his lips, and turns and runs, and all you see is a cloud of dust from the elk running away, and here comes a group of horses in. And, he, you know, if you're out competing or scaring off a bull elk, there's not much else that has a chance. During the long, hot summer months, Scott says it's not uncommon to see dead animals, horses and everything else, who just can't get enough water. But when the water runs low, the horses drink first. And there was one just sad series of pictures of a mule deer doe. She walks in, large group of horses on the water source. The photos unfold like a stop motion movie. The doe waits quietly on the outskirts of the herd. The horses don't let her in. She makes this big semicircle around the spring, never makes it to the water, never see her again. The BLM has worked with the Nevada Department of Wildlife to install special fencing around the springs that deer and other creatures can jump over or climb under, but horses can't. Each fencing and spring restoration job can cost up to $50,000. Scott says that's money spent on the Band-Aid, not the root of the wild horse problem. It's still dark as we drive down the valley, but I can see the first fingers of sunlight touching 11,000-foot peaks that are still white with snow. Scott slows the truck down as we pull off onto a rocky jeep track that curls off through the sagebrush. I am hoping to see a sage grouse. Our leg's gonna be right out my window here. Um, He grabs his binoculars and quietly climbs up into the bed of the pickup to get a better view. I think I just heard a head. Yeah, something flew here. Yeah. There's one male at least back here. Yeah, they're right on the break of the hill. There's at least four there. Cool. The birds are at least a quarter mile away but we can see them dancing and fighting. The males puff up these big white air sacs on their chests and flap and swipe them with their wings to make a bubbling, popping sound. It's hard to hear from this far away, but they're there. This is what's called a trend lek, a mating site that biologists monitor every year to see how the population is changing over time. So this lek is one of the very few left active in this valley. Uh, there's a handful on private properties up along the base of the mountain there. But for the most part, on this drier side of the valley, um, all the known leks have more or less gone into inactivity over the years. And this is the kind of last holdout. We walk quietly out into the sagebrush away from the truck. The birds are still several hundred yards away. Really brittle sagebrush and no grass underneath, like nothing. All around me, I can see piles of horse manure, and the sagebrush has been munched down almost to the ground. There are more than 3,500 horses in the area surrounding this lek. Just rocky, dry soil. 
Adult sage grouse can survive by eating only sagebrush, but their newly hatched chicks need green grasses and insects to start their lives right. That means the hens look for lush spots in the landscape to raise their young. And of course, that's where horses tend to gather too and eat all that delicious green stuff the baby birds need. You look at, you know, the sage grouse typically are nesting somewhere near, you know, within a couple miles of a lake, and there's very little suitable nesting habitat left in this valley. And it'd be pretty tough to raise a brood out here when there's next to no forbs, no grasses, you know, limited insect life. Sage grouse numbers are declining here and across the West for a variety of different reasons. Drought, invasive species, wildfires, oil and gas development. So I want to be super clear that it's not just the horses that are to blame. But in this area, and across much of the region Scott studies, horse numbers have risen steadily over the years, and sage grouse numbers are down. A recent peer-reviewed study in the journal Wildlife Management projected that within a decade, if wild horse populations continue to grow at current rates, sage grouse populations will decline by 70% in areas where the two species share the landscape. The sun's coming up as we get back in the truck and head south. Scott also studies mule deer, and this valley is home to the largest herd in the state. He tells me he got a notification on his phone that one of the tracking collars he put on a mule deer has stopped moving, which is probably a bad sign. So we head toward the signal to see what's up. Scott points out Spruce Mountain up ahead. This is an important wintering spot for mule deer. In the fall, they migrate from the snowy 11,000-foot Ruby Mountains to the north down to this gentler part of the valley, where there are sunny, south-facing slopes, and they can usually find enough food to get them through the coldest part of the year. There's just one problem. Oh, I think I see horses. Yeah, there's a couple of horses moving off the lake there. A couple of brown horses race across the sagebrush ahead of the truck. Uh, it's the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> We're going to get around the corner and see dozens and dozens and dozens more. Um, it's just the sad reality of anywhere that wildlife wants to be, the horses want to be also. And Scott's right. We see more and more horses, counting them off in bands of five, six, seven, as we bump along the jeep track looking for the collared deer. So we lucked out. This poor girl died right next to the road. Really? I follow him through the sagebrush as he searches for the deer. And looking around me, just like at the sage grouse lek, the place is trashed. There's not a blade of grass, horse poop everywhere. Now, Scott says, picture a mule deer who's pregnant, hungry, cold, and tired from a 70-mile migration. She shows up at this spot to hopefully make it through the winter and finds it's already munched down by horses who have been hanging out there all summer and fall. There's nothing left to eat. Everywhere. Everywhere. Mm. I mean, all of this horse use overlaps almost exclusively with this small little winter range. So she may very well have starved to death. Uh, that would be my guess. Part of her. We start seeing tufts of fur clumped between the sagebrush and know we're getting close. Then Scott stops. Oh, okay. Here we go. What do you see? <laughs> a pretty heavily utilized carcass. Um, we have not been able to locate any of the major leg bones. There's a few vertebrae, a cracked skull, and a collar. About all we have left. The carcass has been picked clean. It's very hard to say exactly what killed this doe. Judging by the wear on her teeth, she was on the older side. And it's the old and the very young who are the first to die in a long, cold winter. 
Scott says with less to eat, the death toll only increases. But this is not just a problem here on this winter range. The sad reality of it is <laughs> there's this winter range that's like this. The two major ones down there, just like it. The one on spruce, just like it. And then the secondary range um, that would have been north of us this morning, yeah, just like it. They're all heavily impacted by horses. And they all have deer dying on them. Mule deer populations like sage grouse are in a pretty steady decline across the West. They have been since the 70s. Biologists like Mike Cox and Scott Roberts acknowledge that it's not just horses that are to blame for these trends. But they say that unlike drought, wildfire, invasive weeds, or diseases, these big picture threats that are very hard to prevent or counteract, we can reduce horse populations. It's, there's nothing more frustrating. Um, you know, we <laughs> write all these reports, shining a light on it. We do these spring inventories, documenting all the use and abuse. We're um, setting up camera traps to look at, you know, the proportion of horse use as opposed to wildlife use on different springs throughout the area. Documenting all of it, and it doesn't feel like we're, it goes anywhere. It falls on deaf ears. You know, a lot of our local partners in the BLM, you know, they're just as hamstrung as we are. The BLM says these herds, and in fact, most of the herds in Nevada, are way over the carrying capacity of the land. Thousands of horses would need to be removed if we want to give sage grouse and mule deer and other creatures a chance. But rounding up wild horses draws public outcry and protest. No one likes the images of helicopters chasing horses into corrals to be hauled off to holding facilities for the rest of their lives. Nor does anyone like thinking about how much money it costs to do all that. So... It's not surprising that most politicians don't want to stick their necks out or burn political capital supporting those efforts, no matter how bad things look on the ground. It all comes down to funding, and it all comes down to Congress, and the political liability of the wild horse issue just isn't worth... It isn't worth it to most politicians, or any politicians, really. And so it just feels like we're... (laughs) <laughs> We're just driving this train off the end of the tracks and nobody seems to care. So, Wild horses hold a different place in the collective imagination of Americans than, say, mule deer or sage grouse. They're a symbol. They're beloved. We have an emotional attachment that, if you ask a lot of biologists, is preventing us from treating them like other wildlife that we manage on public lands across the West. Some might call them the favorite child. Scott and Mike call them bullies. But bottom line, from an ecological standpoint, in many parts of the West, there are way too many horses for the landscape to support. And that picture is only becoming more clear in the light of a changing climate and a drier, hotter West. Next up, what to do about it. The BLM says it needs to reduce wild horse populations by about 50,000 horses across the West. Wild horse activists say roundups are cruel and unnecessary. We'll meet some volunteers who are taking matters into their own hands. It's not rocket science. That is, I think, what we are trying to say. The success that we have is so simple. (laughs) It's stupid simple. This episode was recorded in the Great Basin on the occupied territories of indigenous people. The state of Nevada consists of 27 federally recognized tribes from four nations, the Numu, or Northern Paiute, the Western Shoshone, 
the Washishu or Washo, and the Nuwu, Southern Paiute. Mustang is edited and sound designed by Liza Yeager. Art for the series is by Katie Michael. This is my voice. It can tell you a lot about me, and I'm not changing it for anyone. In NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, you'll find a collection of NPR episodes centered on the Black experience. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get podcasts.